Okay, so welcome back now to the panel discussion. We will be having a panel discussion about half an hour in front here, and um, afterwards we will have an open discussion. Um, and uh, the panel discussion, the idea is that, well, we give the microphone to you, then you can answer, and there will be first, we want to have a statement from each of you, so an opening statement, and then we will have um, two rounds of talks about the individual uh, talks, and then we will have some other questions and in the general panel and you can indicate if you want to answer and then we will open it later on. That's the idea. And I would like to start with uh, Isa. So Isa, your PhD is in complex system simulation and archaeology. Um, how did you actually combine complex system systems with archaeology? Uh, thanks a lot and thank you for the invitation. Um, well, this is, this is one of those questions where um, you know, it's interesting to, to look at the at the general general um, uh, field of it. So, so I initially in my career I worked in Paleolithic archaeology, which is a very data sparse part of archaeology. So, as much as archaeology has less data than say sociology, within archaeology Paleolithic is the orphan of all data. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we would be looking at you know processes that. Ex for example, the out of Africa dispersal, massive processes on global scale where you have, whatever, 50 data points okay. for about half a million years time period and you know, the whole of the old world. So you cannot really play the, the data game where you kind of squeeze the data and analyze it in a million different ways and then say, well, I collected this much data so I have the right to come up with the story behind it. So you have to kind of look at a, at a different, different approach. And, and for me, that's, you know, when I first discovered um, agent-based modeling, that was the perfect approach because it really doesn't matter whether you have five data points or 50 or 500 of, or 500,000, you know, if they fit with your model, then, you know, this is some kind of proof of plausibility of that model. Um, and so you can, you know, the more data points you have, obviously, the more robust explanation you have. But at the end of the day, you can fit even to a small amount of data. So the way I looked at it was basically testing those great um, patterns in human evolution and comparing the models that we already have that are built on the basis of animals with the, the little data that we have. And, and because of the sparsity of the data, I do believe, and quite a lot of people agree with me, it is probably the only way forward. That sounds very interesting. Thank you very much. So for me, it's the next question to you. <laughs> um, so you are the PI uh, of our project, and you're a chair in macroeconomics. And I would like to know how does it feel to be a PI in an archaeological project? <laughs> OK, thank you. Well, it's very good, <laughs> but um, well, you might wonder, well, why does a, a macroeconomist work in a project like, like this? And this is a question that I ask myself sometimes too. <laughs> so um, I, I, I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was seven years ago or so. Um, uh, Anne, Anne Windler and, and Thomas Stöllner came to my office and said, well, we have a project here and we want to uh, work to collaborate with, with economists uh, and they um, approached me and asked, well, would, would you be interested? Because I, in the past, I did some work on, on regional economics, um, and there are obviously some, some, some links, right? So we, we, today we already talked about the spatial distribution of, of artifacts, for example, and that's something that um, people also talk about in, in economics. And I said, well, yes, why not? So I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, and um, I, I strongly believe in cross fertilization right across fields right that you basically can learn something from different uh, um, traditions um, so that's very similar to what you said Edmund right so and uh, uh, and this is for me really a chance to to learn something but maybe also to um, uh, to, to give something right so that's uh, yeah maybe maybe enough for for, for a start um, maybe I can can extend on uh, this a bit later Thank yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and then we would also like to ask you, Mark, so you have presented what you're actually doing with ABMs, and also if we look at your research, one sees and gets the impression that ABM is becoming more and more important in your work, basically. Um, is there any 
or can you just say why is it that your interest in ABM is so much growing? Um, I think it's the same starting point as Isa, but the other way around in the sense that I have a lot of data. <laughs> um, and for me, it's, it's three things. First, it forces me, and it's, a, it's part of a general trajectory when I try to be more formal. Um, and when you have to you know, turn whatever is happening in my brain into a model that I will not code, I have to be very clear. And it's a challenge. And I have to be very clear to myself. So there is an element of, form, of formalism which I find extremely satisfactory. There is a second thing which is, I like the way the agent-based model generally throws stuff at stuff that I never really considered. <laughs> um, never really thought about the wave of advance like that. And that requires me not simply just to sort of, oh God, what is happening? But it also asks me to be more imaginative in the way I deal with my data. Um, it can be quite boring and repetitive to account for bias and these kind of things. But to try to find new way to consider the data, to get the data, uh, potentially even go back to the field and re-ask myself other questions that I find extremely satisfactory rather than just say, oh, I'm going to dig one more. And the last thing, it's fun, <laughs> simply, and it's especially fun when you have to speak with someone who doesn't have a clue. Because what I've discovered on many occasions is that you can have that sort of, oh, come on, you could have opened a handbook of archaeology. But then when the person, whomever, for instance, a climate modeler speaks to me and is trying to explain what the carbon cycle is, I just say, hold on a sec, I could have opened the Wikipedia entry. So there is the humility, but there is the fun of just discovering new stuff. Thank you. I have a last uh, opening question for Edmund. So you are uh, uh, started an economist, then turned to sociology, and it seems that you are everywhere where social and ABM are connected. Now I'm asking you a quite a provocative question. If you can, if sometimes you can, uh, um, so if do people see sees you as a tool sometimes? And then I'm asking this because it was a remark that was made also within our rest of group uh, to Frederick. Uh, unfortunately, I'm also a comedian. Um, and in English, if you say somebody is a bit of a tool, you mean they're slightly stupid and slightly irritating. It's not <laughs> terribly polite. So yes, yeah, some of my less sympathetic colleagues say, oh yeah, Edmund, he's a tool. Um, but to take the question a little bit more seriously, uh, yes, it's a research method, so you can apply it to anything. Um, I guess what is interesting to me is that it's not just a tool. Um, you can't arrive at the end of a research project and have somebody go, oh, just do some modelly stuff. Um, and statisticians sometimes have the same problem. Somebody will hand them a heap of data that's been collected in no sensible way and go, go and do some statisticy stuff and discover something really interesting. Uh, and in a way, what's interesting for me is to be in the project at the design stage and to be involved in the data collection so that the questions are the right questions to help a modeler rather than just random questions that won't help a modeler. Um, and it's, it's how to produce those bits of the, the research process for an agent-based model to make it work better. So yes, a tool, but not just a tool, I think is, is the answer. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so what we, as I said, would now like to do is to discuss a bit between you first um, the talks and starting with Edmund's talk. Um, I would like to ask first the others, uh, the panelists and also Mark, um, about what you think about this talk. So is there something which you found particularly, um, well, that's, that rang a bell for you or something where it was quite the opposite, perhaps? Um, I do not know who wants to give it a start. Isa, perhaps? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so the so okay. So I should start with the very very basic, which is I agree in almost every point that Edmund made. <laughs> <laughs> but, but 
I do think that sociology is a step ahead of us. And, and uh, by saying the step ahead, I can see where the frustration is coming, where you know, if people have been created toy models for 10, 15, 20 years, you're kind of waiting for, OK, so when is that actually going to become useful as an applicable to the real world and capturing the complexity of the, the real world? And this is fair. However, in archaeology, I mean, when you look at the Anasazi model, this was the first formal model, which, you know, as much as it has its problems and as much as, you know, it could have been made better, which is very easy to say in a hindsight, by the way, um, it replaced basically people writing essay, how much, essays about how much do they think that what caused the collapse was warfare or what caused the collapse was environmental change, and then arguing for decades and decades and decades over their hypothesis with having absolutely zero tools to connect it with any data of which they had plenty. So as such, this was, this is, this may not be the perfect model, but it is still the best model out there at this particular point. And you know, it should be regarded as a stepping stone because the whole point is that it is a constantly, you know, you never arrive to the actual truth. You cannot do it, especially for those systems that were in the past. We'll never know. But you can actually get better and better and create uh, explanations that are more robust, more consistent with data, more consistent with more different types of data, and therefore increase your actual knowledge and understanding. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Mike. Michael. Yeah, I, I just would like to um, pick up on this, right? Because um, I also uh, totally agree, but I also agree with you, Mark. So basically, you could say, well, this is to some sense contradictory, but um, I think it's possible to agree with both of you, right? Because it also reminded me of some discussions I had with one of my former PhD students, right? So my PhD student always said, well, everything must be calibrated or validated, right? And, and, and it must be the only proper way to do it is really to have empirical models. We need data for everything, for every step. And I always said, no, there is always a room also for toy models, right? You can learn something from, from toy models. And we had endless discussions on this. And well, I'm an economist, and she was an economist as well. And uh, you, uh, maybe it's very similar, right? right? Because um, age-based modeling is also new in economics, right? So and maybe sociology is a bit more advanced. And, and for, for um, economists, this is something new. And I would say, well, let's start. Let's start with toy models. Let's show that you can do uh, things in a different way, and then we proceed. And I would say, well, your position, so to, to make a stylized uh, statement, what, 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 you, what you argue for is an idealist position, right? You were talking about the truth, right? And, and the, how do we discover truth? And I would perfectly agree that that's the proper way of doing science, right? So basically, we uh, should have a, a good argument for everything. We should have a theory for uh, element selection and, and all these things, right? So, and this, I, I totally agree. But on the other hand, I also agree with Mark, and this would be more a, a pragmatist uh, approach. What, what can we do, right? What is possible, and what is possible in some finite amount of time, right? So it's always a question, when can you deliver what, right? And um, to, to get things started and to get some first idea, it may be worth working with, with toy models and maybe forgetting about uh, 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 data or being very sloppy with, with data in the beginning, right? And I think this can be reconciled. I think it's not a contradiction. Thank you very much. And um, so, Mark, as you have also yeah, been mentioned. Um, um, let's, let's not go into the, into the calibration thing. We can, we can go back to that. The one thing that for me was, I think, key was element, sele element selection. What is the right question? Um, and it's really, really, really frightening how much in archaeology this element selection has just become a sort of a, an epistemological war of I am right because the world is ecologically determined, or no, it is not because the world is phenomenological. Sort of, oh, come on, do we really need to get to that high level of, actually, it's not so much a high level, it's kind of, it's, a low level. it's the low level of three, of three pints in the evening on a Friday when you're when you bored. <laughs> Whilst actually, what I really liked about the, the interface and what you, yeah, what you were saying is, we need to really consider element selection and what comes, what is the price, what are the implications of this element selection, how are we going to make it happen? And that for me is key, beyond the, oh come on, really? <laughs> that again? <laughs> Thank you very much. And so, Edmund, 
What do you take of these? Um, I think I'm only going to pick up one, and I'm not going to be able to answer it. Um, I can't get away from this concern. The Schelling model is interesting, it is clear, it is exciting, it makes people think. But afterwards, I'm not sure what we have learnt. We've clearly learnt something. We know something we didn't know before, but what have we learnt? Have we learnt something about a, a city? Have we learnt something about the behaviour of a formal system? It feels good, but what is it? And I'll just leave that there. I can't answer that question. If I was able to build a better model of the Anasazi that fitted the population data better with less tuning, and I'm, I'm not sure I could, because I'm not an archaeologist, but maybe I could help, then I would know what I had discovered, that my account of what happened in the Longhouse Valley was more plausible than Axtell's account. But with the Schelling model, I'm honestly not sure, and that's not even a criticism. It's just, a, a, what is this thing? What, what have I discovered? Perhaps Michael wants to say something to this? I think this is a very, very deep epistemological question, right? So the, the two questions. The first question of uh, element selection, right? Because in, in reality, these people with the soft holism are right, right? In, in the end, everything is connected to everything, right? And the, uh, the, the question is, wh well, where do you stop, right? So basically, what do you include and what do, don't you include? At least if you, when you're talking about social systems, right? When you're an engineer and you're constructing a machine or something, well, then you can say, okay, this is where the system ends, right? And it's relatively easy to describe the system. But when you talk about social systems, it's very difficult, right, to, 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 to draw the, 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 bo the borderline and say, well, this is what, what should be included and whatnot. And we, I think in general, in, so, in the social sciences, we don't have a theory of that, right? So I think this is very difficult. And the second very hard question is, well, how do we get that, how do we make that step from a model to the real world back again? A model in the end is always a model. The model is not the real world, right? Um, the map is not the territory. And basically, how do we get from the model to the real world? So in economics, we also have this discussion um, uh, how, because as economists, we are typically very sloppy there, right? So we, um, we have a model and we say, well, this is somehow similar to the real world and we, we are very, very brave and make very strong uh, um, statements and draw very strong conclusions for, for, for policy and how the world should be. We make, make very strong normative um, um, statements derived from very simple toy models, right? But we as economists never think about that, but we should, of course. So this is a very, very important question. There are some methodological papers, so Bob Suckton, for example, talks about credible world. World. So we have to create a credible world. This is somehow similar to, to, to the real world. And then we can be somehow confident that what we find in our model world also translates into the, into the real world. But this is a very, very uh, deep methodological issue. Right? Perhaps a short um, final remark in this round by you, Edmund, if you want. Or are you? Yeah, so to this. <laughs> I think you're right. I think it is very difficult, um, but it's good to talk about an example. So, for example, we have the basic shelling model. Um, we could say there's no house prices. So, 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 yeah, yeah, for sure, people have done any number of things. So the, the question is, well, clearly that's empirically foolish. We would expect the ethnic minorities to live in the poor parts of town because generally they're poor. The question is, are we justified then in adding house prices to the Schelling model, or have we kind of missed the point? There's, there's neither an empirical model nor a toy model anymore. We're, we're sort of pretending that we have some anecdotal insight into reality, so we're going to keep adding house prices and more ethnicity types and public parks and jobs and things like this, but is this ever going to get any closer to how people really reason in their heads about where they live and how they look at their neighbourhoods? Or is it just going to get more and more complicated and still be a, a toy model, not be grounded in reality? Because I think the answer to your question about how do we decide what to put in, I think human agency has a lot to teach us. And this is something where economists just, this is a place economists don't go. Um, if you want to understand what aspects of the world are important, you need to hear from somebody who's just moved house because they don't like their neighbourhood. Did they look at the neighbours? Did they look at the schools? Did they look at the parks? Did they look at the cost of housing? Now, that won't determine how the world works because there's stuff they don't know about, like 
racists in City Hall or whatever, but it starts to give us a sense of a limit on what we could need to explain. It's not foolproof, but, but that's an odd answer. The, the, the logic of the model comes from the people who participate in it. So that's a, a kind of another way of thinking about it. Yes, so I would like now to make the opposite. So you commenting on Mark's paper. So perhaps, Isa, do you want to yeah, I always start? start? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Not um, one. So, so you see, I, I don't see much of a uh, contradictory, contradictory uh, elements between the two talks. They look like the extreme that, you know, you argue for one, <laughs> I argue for the other. But the truth of the matter is we agree on one thing squarely, which is it's better to do a model of any time that it, type that is formal than to not do a model or do the model in a non-formal way. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, when you think about the complexity of models, um, so this is, this, is, uh, this is not my thoughts, this is my super, ex-supervisor's thoughts, uh, Seth Bullock, came up with this, um, with this, you know, it's, it's a kind of pyramid shape, kind of uh, balance of like, how can you build a model? And there's always a trade-off between realism, precision, generalism and tractability. And you know, when you think about it uh, with an example, that the most common example of a model that you can ever think of that we're all familiar with is a map. And so, you know, a map can be very precise, but that means it will only cover a small area. So I don't know, military maps, they're super precise. But, but you know, you cannot have the whole world mapped in with a precision. Um, or you can have a realistic map, like for example, what you get in, in guidebooks where you see the you know, little pictures of the facades of, of, of buildings. But that kind of map, again, is probably not very precise and is probably not gonna cover a large area. Or you can have the you know, general map of the world, which is neither precise nor realistic, but it covers our whole world. So it's the same for, for, for models. There's another element, which is the tractability, which in our case would be, you, know, you can map everything you want on any one map. You can map a million things in one map, but you won't be able to read that map. So if you map, I don't know, a city with the population density, the income uh, distribution, the ethnicities of the, of, the, of the people that live there, and the underlying geology, because why not, then at some point you won't be able to use that map because it's not very useful. So there's always, a, always those trade-offs, and I think different disciplines will find themselves in different corners of that, of that combination of trade-offs trade because it's largely determined by the data you can use for those models. But at the end of the day, non, no one model is wrong or bad or you know, worse than another one. They're just, they're just different, right? Michael. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you want to yes, um, well, I, agree, I, I perfectly agree. So um, what you said is um, a model or a map needs to be useful, right? Uh, and this, needs, uh, this means that you need a, a purpose, right? And that's something that I always tell my students in the very first lecture, right? Often people are quite enthusiastic about that m method because you can do so many things, right? You, if you are a skilled modeler, you couldn't put everything into the model. Um, there's hardly any limit, but then that's not useful. And if you don't have a precise question, you don't get any answers, right? So, and, and you have to be clear what, what the purpose is. What do you want to do? And then you can say a model is good, helping me to, to get to that purpose or not, right? But uh, one other aspect that I would like to emphasize, what you mentioned and what I find very interesting is, you said, well, uh, you, you, you are excited when, when people from, from different disciplines um, fit to, uh, together at a table and start talking, right? And, and agent-based modeling is uh, a way to, to achieve this, right? So, uh, and to be clear and really to find one common language, right? And because in the end you have to be very precise and you have to, have to model it, you have to tell the computer what to do, and then you have to be precise and you have to, 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 to discuss uh, until you're really clear uh, how, how to, to write it down and how to implement it in computer code. And I think this is something that, that is very, very useful, right? That you can get different people from different traditions with different original languages together uh, working on a, uh, really collaborating on a, on a joint project and, and producing something new, right? Because that's what I said in my, my first statement. I really believe that something new arises from diversity, right? That you basically recombine existing ideas and, and bodies of, of, of knowledge. Right. 
Adam, it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you. I think I find myself somewhere between you, literally as well as metaphorically. Um, but also there's something here that we're not quite saying, and I think that's something about uh, time. Um, and, and that's true in two senses. The first sense is, as you said, um, the first model of this cultural process is way better than no model. Um, but also I'm thinking about um, this, you know, what ha what's the second model? And how does the second model follow from the first? Is the second model just another made-up model? And then what do we do? Or is it an extension of this model, which is great if this model is, is right in some sense, uh, but then you end up with big tribes of people who like one particular class of model and other big tribes of people who like another model, and you're kind of back where you started. Um, but the other dimension of time is, uh, what, what is our reference group? So the reason I show Hagerstrand is because in a sense, we've all known this could be done since 1965. Most sociological modelers simply don't bother. And the reasons for that must be non-scientific. They must be to do with the pressure to publish and stuff like this. So the question is then, OK, maybe sociology is kind of ahead of archaeology. But the que there's still a question about where we ought to be, given what has already been done. And, and that's kind of interesting, too. You know, what, what should our level of attainment be at this point, given all the research we've conveniently forgotten? So I think that the sort of time dimension, how a particular model fits into your discipline, how it fits into other models, perhaps in other disciplines, is we haven't really dealt with that here. But I think it's actually quite important. And I'm quite interested in model progress. Uh, but we've barely started. To, since we've barely started to build good models at all, the idea of model progress has really not been on our agenda yet, but I think at some point it's going to have to be. If Mark, you want to reply? Um, I think that, first and foremost, in my view, models will all be always be tested not so much against the truth, but against the body of hypotheses they can help you to generate. And that is quite a, a key thing. Can you actually, is the value of the model is what, how does it help you to generate more hypotheses that you're going to be able to test. Um, where do you stop? And yes, of course, I kind of put myself really at one extreme of the, of, of the spectrum. Uh, and I do not say that about my psychology. Um, the one I wanted to show is the fact that we made a series of explicit de decision. The second stage will actually be to actually try to calibrate because I, I think that there probably are ways to calibrate and to, and to turn the model into another direction, even though overfitting will always be an issue. But that will require, indeed, that interdisciplinary dialogue to start from scratch. And it's one of the things that um, I, I was referring to that uh, volume that, we've re that is in, in press with Mehdi Sakali. It's one of the things that we've said very often, and I'm guilty, that's what we did in my project, the modeling comes post-hoc. It comes towards the end. Whilst actually, if you put it at the beginning, it makes things much more interesting, much more complicated, because you have to start by leveling the ground. And unfortunately, I do not know how it is in different traditions, but clearly, at least in, for instance, in the French system, speaking from Medi's experience, and to some extent in the British system, from a funding point of view, it doesn't work, because you do not have you know, work package one, the ecology, work package two, the archaeology, work package three, the demography, or oh, and work package four, the modeling, because it's going to look good. That works really well as a funding process, but as an intellectual process, it should be the other way around. That's difficult, and that is just a, it's, a, it's an economic hard reality, and that's unfortunate. I perfectly agree, right? And uh, I think this is a, an, a, a question of the sociology of science, right? So um, uh, who is allowed to collaborate with whom, for example, by the constraints? And what, what kind of research are we allowed to do, right? You said, well, in principle, you should document all your steps, right? And you should also not only the, the coding and the formal model description, but you should also, as I, if, I, if I got you right, you should also document, for example, your discussion right the discussions that you had with your with your colleagues right and and also maybe the the dead ends that led nowhere 
right? But this is extremely hard to do, right? You are basically uh, punished if you do this, right? You're not rewarded for doing this. What we are all uh, rewarded for is writing scientific articles, but uh, you, you don't have a chance uh, of, of explaining everything on 30 pages in a, in a, in a, in a normal uh, journal article, right? So that, that's the way how we organize the scientific system, right? And um, you and I and everybody who, who, who does this kind of research always has to uh, defend himself or justify why we are doing this. Why are you collaborating with archaeologists, right? Why are you talking to sociologists, right? You are an economist. Already, already these uh, kind of attributions, you're an economist or you're an, uh, a sociologist, um, in the end, we are all studying social systems, right? And, and uh, this should not matter what you are, right? But in, in, in practice, it is. Right, and it, it, it matters a lot who is your ref, referee uh, when you when you submit a, 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 a publication or a, a paper to a to a journal, right? And if you want to get funding, it gets even worse. Yeah. Um, so I, mean, I just want to kind of take it take it from for where you stopped. Um, you know, there's this this element to it that. Um, Combining the different disciplines, like the one thing that I noticed for, for the data I usually deal with was that there were many different types of specialists working on archaeological sites and coming up with different types of data. And at the end of the day, there was no glue to put the data together. So you had, okay, so do people here ate more pigs than cows and people here ate more chicken than cows? So what? And at the end of the day, I think we all have to kind of make a big step backwards and just think very carefully about what do we want to achieve in the grand scheme of things. And I think in the grand scheme of things, we don't want to be the kind of people that go through archaeology and turn it into history understood as like one damn thing after another, which is what you can do if you only base yourself on data. First this happens, then this, then this culture came, then this culture came. But the truth of the matter is that what we really want to achieve is to understand the fundamental processes that drive societies. And that cannot be achieved only with data. You need data to do so, but without coming with hypotheses of how and why things happen and what is the mechanisms of change, like you cannot achieve it. And the only way of dealing with this kind of processes and understanding them is by modeling of one way or another. Um, just a point that's kind of outside the academic is, is one of the things that interests me is when we have to step back from what we normally do and think about institutions. So um, if you're an ethnographer, you don't think anything of keeping field notes and then using only the bits you need for the articles. That's just what you do. And similarly, if you're running a research project, there's almost no cost to recording the meetings. The cost only comes when you actually want to analyze the data. So, so sometimes I think the solution to these things is just to think about them in different ways. If we wanted to, to completely document a research project, what would it take and what would be the minimum effort required? And, and I have to say personally from, from agent-based modeling that sometimes the best solution is something institutional. So we got so fed up with not being published in other people's journals that we started Jazz. Um, and we're just about to start something else which we think meets another gap in, in the publishing. So sometimes it, it, trying to find an, economic, uh, an academic solution is, is the wrong thing to do. And it's like, okay, let's, let's change the nature of the game. Let's change the institutions. I would like to follow up on this, basically, um, with a question which... Ba or do we want to... Okay, so with a question which very much fits into this. So this is a question, so we have now been talking about ABM, we have also been talking about how important it is, or it, we all believe that it's a good way of thinking and making progress, but what about teaching ABM, basically, because that is not a standard in economics, in archaeology, also in sociology perhaps the most, but it's still not. So what is your, what do you think about this, or change about this, or I, who, who wants to... Mark? Okay, I'm going to answer because I cannot teach it in the sense that I do not model. Um, but what I can teach and what I do teach is methods. So how are you going to you know, do something with the stuff? And from that point of view, try to explain what is a model, what are the requirements of the model, what is the price of making a model, actually is a very, and that's something I do, is a very elegant way and a very beautiful way to actually go back to basic archaeological methods and it's 
it's not so much a question of the teaching of the modeling, it's the a question of teaching the intellectual hygiene that comes with thinking in terms of models. And it's not so much, what I can teach is not really hard, high level of model, but basic regression and bit of stats and this kind of thing. And it's the intellectual process and it's the engagement with not simply the data, but the way of thinking. That is where I think we need to start. Somebody want to briefly add something to this? Yeah, I think um, that works very well on a, on a practical level. It's one of the things I get my students to do is, is to describe a social process before they start to code. So they just do it as a group exercise. Um, and that really helps them when they're thinking about coding to see what to do. Uh, but the other point is that you're quite right. I think there is a connection. Um, I don't find any problems with teaching ABM once I've got a group of people to teach it to. What interests me is the problem with ABM being very thinly spread and it being very hard for any one institution to teach a decent number of students and for certain sub-communities to not have anybody who can teach them but archaeology sounds like there's just not that many people. Um, so I guess what I'm interested in is how to design institutions to change that game, whether we should all be going to online teaching or trying to organize rolling summer schools as more, you know, more summer schools or something. Because I think, I think in the existing model with competing universities, there's, there's a bottleneck. So then the question is, how do we think outside the box to get rid of the bottleneck so that everybody who wants to learn this stuff can at reasonable cost but learning from people who really know what they're doing. And that, to me, is the, the problem. The actual teaching it is actually not that difficult, I think. It's, it's getting, getting the infrastructure in place so that there are people there to be taught who want to be taught, and they can get what they need out of it. Yeah, I would like to add two things. Um, the first is, well, we as economists, uh, we, we model a lot, right? And we always teach our students, um, well, in principle, to understand models, the mathematical models, the analytical models. But very often, we don't get them to really build their own analytical models because it's too difficult, right? But if you do agent-based modeling, you can get them started and doing something quite quickly, right? Uh, even if it's stupid models and if it's not very if it's toy models, but still, right? You can get them doing something, and this is really valuable, right? So that's one thing. So that's what I really like. But on the other hand, you say teaching is simple. In principle, yes, it is. But what I really believe is if you want to train somebody uh, in agent-based modeling, there are at least three elements, right? You have to teach them in theory and and modeling, right? So basically you have to teach them some background and, and how to build a model. Then of course you need the implementation in the computer, right? And uh, at least you need some basic knowledge. Even if you're not a programmer, you still have to understand what the computer does and, and how algorithmic thinking works and so on. And thirdly, Data, of course, right? How, because what you get out of your model is data, right? You get lots of numbers, and you have to analyze them. You have to basically, you, you have to visualize your data. You have to do statistic, statistical analyses. And that's an awful lot, right? That's difficult, and it's probably nothing that one person can or should do, right? You basically need teams, right? So you know, uh, ideally, on a team, you would have at least three, pe uh, three, three persons, one with a theory, theoretical background, one with a programming background, and one with a data science or a statistical background. But still, you have to, uh, you have to prepare everybody that they can collaborate in such a team, right? And this, this is really a challenge, because it's a lot, a lot right? It's just very much. Perhaps yeah, just a quick comment. So just a super quick comment to that and to what you guys said. You see, I think without kind of mass education, we're not going to get far because the, the end game is not to get everyone to build agent-based models. The end game is to make sure that anyone that finishes a degree in sociology, economy, or archaeology understands the models that have been published and can critically engage with them. And without that, it's not going to happen. And I look at uh, GIS, which is a dominant kind of computational technique in archaeology, where it was in a pretty pretty similar state. I mean, there were some specialists that could do it, and now it's just rolled over through undergrads um, courses 
throughout the UK and, and other countries. So I don't think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lost cause. I think what we need is people to basically get a little bit of agent-based modeling so that they can engage with what is published, but not necessarily train everyone to kind of high-level uh, modeler. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so an related question to this, I would like to ask you, it's okay you are talking about teaching. You pointed out that uh, in the archaeology there is a, a NIC that is using AVM. So how, uh, in order to construct those team and those synergies, so how can you relate to people who are not using AVM and they do not know what AVM is? So this is also an important uh, question if you want to work in a group. Um, it's a problem that I, that we encountered in my group. Um, I remember that when the, we, when the mother produced the first simulation, part of the group just said, I refuse to engage with this <laughs> because I am not a robot. And we, I think that the question was, the first hurdle was we are not trying to reproduce. We are trying to mimic. We are trying to get to one of those behavior process. And it is just a what if. And really, the, the first step was don't forget about the robot thing. Try to, in, to identify that the only thing it is is what you've been doing before, but just in a formal way. And really get rid of that first limit. What it is, it is just exactly what you've been doing in a narrative, putting two and two together. It's just done in a very formal way. Once you get there, you get people to start thinking. And I think that is a very difficult conceptual thing to do. And in, I don't know how we do it. <laughs> Brutal force? <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> PhDs? <laughs> <laughs> but it's the I think that the, the problem has too often been, oh, it's mathematical, therefore it's true. I said, no, no, it's mathematical, it's formal, that is what you should have been doing anyway. And if you angle it that way, it's a bit better. <laughs> I think um, my experience is that it's a bit like dating. What you, what you do is you, you put a little bit out and some people will ignore it, whatever you do, and then some people will come a little bit closer together, and then you put a little bit more out, and they put a little bit more out, and then you gradually build up a network of people who are sympathetic or interested, but you have to remember that lots of people, you know, th they will never be interested. So really it's just this repeated process of, you know, PhD students come and go, oh, I thought what you said was really interesting, can I apply it to my topic? Um, but you have to remember you'll never catch everybody. And it's just that thing about you, you put it out and you put it out and you meet new groups and new people. But it's always going to be a minority sport. And, and that's as it should be. It's not appropriate that it takes over the world. There are some problems it's just not very good, useful for. Sometimes the world is simple. So, yeah, I think of it as like dating. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I think as a, as a modeler, you also have to be uh, humble, right? And you have to be defensive, right? You never should tell the others that you have a better methodology, right, and that, you, that, that they always did it wrong, and now you tell them how to do it properly, right? Um, uh, I think this doesn't work. You have to say, yes, of course there are limits, right, and I'm totally aware of all, all the limits and all the criticisms, right, and, and uh, all the critical points, they are true, right? Um, but of course, we have something to offer, right? And it's always, in a sense, um, that you that you're asking for for acceptance and, and tolerance, right? And say, okay, we, we want to offer something, and let me explain to you why it might be helpful, right? And if you don't like it, fine, right? So I think this this is, is a way being, in a sense, open but but defensive. Okay. Thank you very much, and. Um well, because we also have the open discussion after this, um, I think this is a good moment to stop the panel and afterwards invite those. But before it's, we stop it, we would like each of you to have a brief statement uh, to our um, guiding question of what are the limits of ABM in archaeology, like a few sentences, and you can be brave or humble, uh, whatever you decide. Um, and perhaps we just go this way, and you have the start again? You don't? I start again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So just like Edmund said, our agent-based modeling is a method, and every method has its limits. Um, but the important thing here to remember here is to remember, um, you know, whether my hammer is better than the hammers that have been available before. Because if it is, even if it's not the perfect hammer, it's still a better option. And you know, we should strive for perfection, but we should also be pragmatic. Um, and we should use the tools that are available that are the best at a given moment. So I can imagine that in some time, we will, somebody will come up with even better method than agent-based modeling that can tackle some of the problems we've been dealing with in a, in a better way. But as far as we're sitting here, this is one of the best ways of looking into those fundamental questions about how society works, how people behave, why do they behave like that, why things happen the way they happen. And, um, and arguing against it is like arguing against the fact that two plus two is four. So I think we should just get on with it, basically. Uh, I'll stick my neck out so that people can disagree with me and say that I think it's possible agent-based modeling is the last method and that actually there won't be another hammer. Um, having said that, um, I think data is clearly the real limitation. We cannot argue our way around the data or the lack of it. We have to work with that. Um, but I think the other main limitation at the moment, and I guess that's where my research come from, is our own confusion and our own lack of clarity about terminology, about methods, about what we're trying to achieve, what the goals of our research are. And we can fix that. That's what we do, is think clearly and try and get things straightened out. So I'm quite optimistic that a lot of these limitations we can actually remove because they are unnecessary. We just haven't thought hard enough about these things yet. Um, in the 80s, there was a, a book published called um, Archaeological Hammers and Theories, where people, um, the, the, the argument was to say that archaeologists are terrible with theories because they look at them and they use them like hammer. They start hammering everything. And I think that's the problem with ABM. It should not, partly because there are some data limits, be used for everything. But what it does beautifully is that it's a beautiful method. And like any method, you should use it carefully, but first and foremost, you should be imaginative. And it requires quite a lot of self-questioning from a theoretical point of view, element justification, and all of that. And that's what I've always been trying to teach when I teach methods. Methods are fun. Methods are Im good for imagination. And they make you engage and get your act together. And from that point of view, I think that ABM is very, very fundamental. I totally agree with everything. Um, well, but, but I want, want to add some, some aspects. So um, I think one of you said um, uh, what, whatever you can express or explain can also be modeled, right? I, I really believe that you can model almost everything, which is really good. But there is a limit, which is communication, right? So the, the, the more difficult the models get, the more sophisticated the models get, the more difficult it is really to explain what you learned and where it comes from and, and what you exactly did, right? If you have hundreds of pages of uh, model documentation, right? And if you have thousands and thousands of computer code, it's, it gets intransparent. That's one thing. And the second is that it's just not easy for us humans to grasp what's going on, right? That's just not the way we think, right? So we need stories, narratives, right? So um, a narrative may be, of course, very vague and may, may be too simple, but it's, it's more accessible to, to most of us, right? And there, this is one limit, right? That um, if you are not a trained specialist, it may be very hard to get an idea what's going on. But this is, of course, uh, a limitation of any kind of formal modeling, right? So this is not very, it may be a bit worse with, uh, uh, um, with, with agent-based modeling because it's computer modeling, right? You need computer code, and this can be very intransparent even for us as modelers. So this might be, might be a limit. Thank you very much. I have the, <laughs> the microphone, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we would like to open the discussion also to the public. I don't know if there is somebody who wants to ask something. Yes, and also goodbye to those at home at the stream. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Mitya will now pass the microphone bye bye. to those who have questions. The millions watching us now. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, 
Me. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the talks and the interesting discussion. Um, I've got a question. Um, last week I uh, was on a conference and they talked about, um, there was a philosopher who talked about um, free will and determinism. And now <laughs> I was wondering if you, if you, uh, if you uh, how you can, or I, I, I'm sure it is a discussion in a ABM modeling how to implement something like free will or human, or what is it in the end? Uh, or I mean, it's they are totally deterministic your models, and how to implement such th such thing as free will, whatever it means. Okay, on the one end, there's the part of me that was trained as an anthropological archaeologist who is looking at ethnography that strongly believe in agency, and I do have agency. Okay, thank you. Um, on the other side, in a way, there is also a moment where I don't care, and where I also realize that at the end, I'm a sp just an ecological being with requirement as a species. And therefore, what it becomes is not so much denying agency, it's just putting myself at a level where I can justify that, yes, there will be some noise, agency, people do bizarre stuff and they do stuff full stop. But also, as a, for instance, at the population level, there is just something called ecology where you have to survive and where at that level, the model can encapsulate an element of reality, which is where agency does not really matter. And the, the thing is, what, what is it that you're trying to do? You're not trying to make a model that explains everything. You're trying to make a model that explains something at a particular level. The kind of thing that we've done works well, I think, under certain circumstances at a sort of population level, but it does not explain the distribution of any single artifact within a household of the, of the early Neolithic. So it's a sort of, it's not that it's a non-question. When people throw agency at you, it's because they don't have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, oh, oh sorry. sorry. No, no, yeah. I didn't. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm always first. Um, so I think this is a great question, because I think we can now show what uh, Mark meant when he said the hygiene of thinking. I will model your free will, no problem. But you have to first tell me, what do you mean by it? <laughs> and I don't care what the definition is, but you have to be pretty specific, because I have to write it in a code. So whether you, and I'm absolutely fine with you coming up with five different definitions. I will code them all, not a problem. <laughs> but then free will gets a matter of uh, randomness or probability, or is it, or is it that I was going to make this point, that point, but I think I'll try and use a concrete example. So I go to the shops, I have a shopping list, um, and I follow the shopping list, and I buy the things on the list. So have I given up my free will? Well, no, of course not, because I, I drew up a list and agreed to follow it. But if while I'm walking around the shop, I suddenly think, oh, chocolate biscuits, I will go and buy chocolate biscuits. But I'm quite likely to go, oh, chocolate biscuits, not, oh, toilet cleaner because that's not what people suddenly go, oh, for. So, so I guess the question is, we don't want to just add noise to the model, because that's not really very helpful. Um, but we do know something about what free will means. It means that you, you have a plan or you have a strategy, but you also know if the strategy isn't working or you're not enjoying it, or it causes a problem, that you might have another strategy, or you might have a meta strategy. Okay, now I need to think about this properly because my routinized behavior is not working. Now, I don't know whether that's what you mean by free will, because that's your point about you have to tell us and then we model it, but we can think about the kinds of things we might be talking about that, that you can sometimes break out of your procedure and go to a higher level procedure, but if you push that argument too far, you get back to Mark. It's kind of like, well, we can keep making difficulties for modeling and say it's deterministic. But, but at some point, it just gets silly. You know, if I have a plan and I have a way of breaking out of the plan and I have a set of alternatives that will then allow me to replan, 
is that still deterministic or is that free will or you know what do we do that's different from that that we can understand it's but it's a really good you're right it's a really good question this is sort of one that creates a great new kind of model somehow another question perhaps anybody Gary Okay, thank you. So you, since you all mentioned the importance of having a clear defined question before implementing ABN, but actually from your talk, it seems like you pursue the result, but I didn't see what's the clear question behind the, behind this, uh, all this ABN research. Because for example, if you're studying the spread of Neolithic farming in Europe, what's the so you use the ABM, but what's the, the question you try to well, address? You don't have to agree with me. Okay, well, I, in, in that case, yeah, I, I kind of skimmed that part. Um, <laughs> so the question is, the question was very, very simple in a way. It's spread of farming is we know that we have a population expanding. That we kind of know now. It's no problem. The qu what we do not know is what is happening to the cultural package of a population expanding. Are they just keep on doing the same thing? Or do they start adapting? Whatever. And that was just the question. Under demographic expansion, so it's demographically driven expansion rather than an expansion driven by greed or something else. What is happening to the cultural package? That was the question. And the question was then addressed via one particular model. The only, the main, in my opinion, the main theoretical limit that we hit with the model was that we made an assumption regarding the nature of the interaction between the people, and we decided to go for homophily. And I can actually justify that for, for various, various, various reasons. But the question was, what is happening to a population which is expanding a demographic stress from a cultural point of view? Because actually, from an archaeological point of view, we can tackle the entire identifying a population expanding in this awful lot of literature on growth rate and spread rate and all of this kind of stuff. But we have left totally void the question of what is happening to the material culture, which at the end is what we are interested in. That was the question. And the ABM was a very elegant way to start generating hypotheses regarding that. Does that answer? But do you need to come up with answer so and then the, you, uh, to test the answer or have just just done the model wrong and give you an answer is it which way should be it's more like you come up with the answer first and to test it. so from the engineering literature from the world of engineering comes the answer um, yes you can build a model without a research question and then explore it for however long you, you want. And you know there is some probability that you will find something interesting and answer some kind of question that will kind of come post hoc. However, the, the issue with what, do you, what are the elements you put in the model and what are the elements you, you re remove, basically the, the metaphor that is often used for it is that, that the, your research question is like the knife you use to carve your model. So if you just put everything in and shake the bag, the probability, the, the probable outcome is that you won't learn anything useful, or at least it will take you a lot of time. But if you have the research question first, then you can build the model accordingly, and then all of the subsequent decisions about what goes in, what goes out, how do I, what data do I need, how do I compare it, etc., you basically make that decision on the basis of what is your research question. And also, um, because we only have finite time, the discussion gets simplified. So um, it would be valid to have as a research question, um, is Nicholas Luhmann's theory of communicative action coherent? So you build an agent-based model that tries to implement a particular social theory and then see whether you can do it and whether the theory makes sense. So that would be, when I, a research question doesn't have to be an empirical research question or it can be a methods question. Can I produce a model that fits the data where I can justify all the elements of the model that I've put in from existing research? And the answer to that question is yes or no. And if it's no, you can go and do some more research. So it doesn't have to be a question like, why did the longhouse valley civilization collapse. Um, it, it can be a question about methods or a question about theory 
or some other kind of thing, but it has to be a, a clear question, whatever it is. Sorry? Could be a simple or complex. Yeah, I would also um, like to say something about the Anasazi model, right? So, Edmund, you were criticizing that model a lot, and you said, well, um, uh, can we explain the collapse? Um, you could also reframe the question and said, well, I'm not sure whether this is really what they did or whether this is only what they claimed to do, but you could say, well, can we explain the evolution of population uh, over uh, some period of time and also the collapse just by climatic and hydrological uh, conditions, right? And then they found, no, there are some deviations, and this is apparently not enough, right? So there is something missing. We don't know what's missing, but uh, at least the story is not as simple. And uh, apparently, I'm not an archaeologist, but apparently there are some people who say, well, it was climate. We know that it was climate, uh, and it was uh, water scarcity, and that's why that uh, culture collapsed. And they mm, 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 showed, by example, that this may not be true. There is uh, something missing to the story. And that's something, and I think I would say that that's a valid research question, right? And this can be very specific. This is more specific than that you say, well, I claim that I can explain the collapse with the model. Maybe not. Maybe it's more, more modest what they do. Yeah. yeah, so in a way, it helps you to generate and to test, generate new hypotheses and try to find ways to test them. But it also makes you, following on the, on the previous point, it also makes you go beyond correlation causation. So the entire climate collapse, it boils down just to curve fitting. You will always be able to find a curve that fits another curve. Look at spurious correlations on internet. There's a beautiful website. You will always find, and I will only speak for my discipline, archaeology is Oh my God, so fantastically gifted at doing bad correlations. Yeah. <laughs> we are experts at generating curves and say, oh my God, they fit, sort of. Mm. And they said, no, that, that, I can do that, thank you. And this just, that's brute force. What the model helps you to do is to say, okay, if it is the case, these are the assumptions that you are making, I'm going to try to reproduce, and then you discover, hmm, hmm does not. And that is very interesting, because what you're doing is to say, well, rather than just put two and two together and discover that, oh my god, it goes together, you actually try to make it explicit why it should go together, and you move away from the correlation towards the causation. Sorry, very quick point. Um, it, it may just come down to how you write it, because you're completely right. At the end of a lot of these papers, there is this, it does not get explained just by climate, which is fine. But if that's what your research question was, why not put it in the introduction? Why not just leave it out until you get to the conclusion? Because otherwise it just looks like an excuse. So, so I think the, one of the practical problems is how people write this. And all we've got to go on is how they write it. For all I know, they had a very clear research question, but it's good to put it in the introduction. This is also something that is very... You know, this is this is touching on the holistic kind of way of doing archaeology and on other disciplines. Where when you compare any formal model with its limitations and its its kind of you know, it's always going to be a simplification, abstraction of the real system, which does not necessarily need to apply to a model developed in in natural language, where you can in theory consider everything, or at least consider a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of different parameters and different aspects and different elements of the system. But at the end of the day, you basically wrote a few sentences about each of them. So you're not actually considering them rather than just listing them. Is there another question from anybody? Otherwise, I would have one question. That is, the question is, um, are we allowed to let our ABMs fail to answer whatever questions we have if we want to publish and stay in academia? <laughs> um, so when we published, um, <laughs> when we did all the toy models, um, Basically, what, one of the reasons we published all of them is because we had to make from pages because we had been asked by someone. And an awful lot of those models do not say much. <laughs> and what I do remember is saying, oh, God, this model is failed. This model fails. This model fails. 
and at least one, if not two, of the reviewers, and I think I can look at someone else on the panel here, <laughs> told me, yes, that's all right, they failed. Be a little bit more positive about the fact that they failed. And that was actually quite cool because it just said, well, actually, it was stupid a question. And it, we learn quite a lot by trying to do stuff that failed. This being said, I'm very happy that we eventually got something that did not fail. <laughs> Uh, there's the famous quote in physics about something that is so bad it's not even wrong. Uh, there, there ought to be value in having a clear research question, building a model, showing that the model doesn't, uh, doesn't sh makes sh clear that the question is inarticulate or that we, we haven't understood it yet. Um, I, I don't think we should not have a research question because that's more convenient in terms of you can't prove the person failed. We have to kind of man up to this or person up to it, um, even if sometimes it makes us look less good, I guess. Whether we can get away with that is another matter. Well, I, I completely disagree with all of you in a way here because I don't think an ABM can fail. What fails is a hypothesis that is represented. And most of the time, it's not even my hypothesis, so I don't actually generally don't give a crap about it. <laughs> uh, the good thing is that, um, you know, like I went to a Roman archaeology conference uh, a few months ago, and I've learned an amazing fact, which is that somebody listed and counted the number of hypotheses for the fall of Rome, and it turns out it's 472. I mean, you don't fail by disproving some of them. You're actually moving forward. <laughs> So thank you. If are there any other questions? Otherwise, I would say we just ask the questions more direct and have a glass of wine or a beer or a brezel or a water just there. And thank you very much. And also thank thank you very much yeah, for coming and having. This.